So this afternoon, after hearing speakers from the UC system and other libraries and organizations that we work with here at Santa Cruz quite a bit, we're going to hear from people from our own community, the UC Santa Cruz community, now is that better? Um, talking about their work with the library in support of their own research, learn, teaching, and learning. So, and following their remarks again, we'll have an opportunity um, for a facilitated discussion. Uh, our speakers are not sitting in the order they're going to speak, just to keep people guessing. But so are <laughs> Silvana Falcone, Associate Professor of Latin American and Latino Studies, Danielle Crawford, a graduate student in literature, and a former fellow of the Library's Center for Archival Research and Training Program, or CART as we call it, Jody Green, Professor of Literature and Founding Director of the Center for Innovation and Teaching and Learning, and finally Christy Caldwell, a Research Support Services Librarian focusing on science and engineering. Our facilitator for the discussion is Trisha Cruz, who is the Executive Director of DataSight, a leading global nonprofit organization that provides persistent identifiers for research data. So we heard some about that this morning. Uh, their goal is to help the research community locate, identify, and cite research data with confidence. Trisha was formerly a government documents librarian at UCSD, my boss, and the founding director of UC3, the UC Curation Center at the California Digital Library before going to data site. So, go ahead, turn it over. All right. Can everybody hear me okay? Oh, yeah. Well, uh, Good afternoon, and I hope everybody got a chance to enjoy their lunch. I really want to thank um, Rachel and Elizabeth for the invitation. I'm really delighted to be here. Um, so I really want to talk about the ways uh, my teaching has changed um, because of my relationship with the Digital Scholarship Commons and the way I've been sort of incorporating technology in the classroom space. And as a result, I have now this new sort of learning objective. You know, I know the university likes to have our learning, you know, our goals and our learning objectives. And now I've really thought about media literacy skills as, um, and just media skills as a new learning objective for myself. When I first arrived <clears throat> to UC Santa Cruz in 2010, uh, the social science division used to have a media lab. And those of you who may have been on the campus longer know about this lab. But eventually it closed um, in the first couple of... Hi, Jody. <laughs> in the first couple of years... <laughs> in the first couple of years that I was here. And so um, I was delighted when this new initiative emerged at the university um, with the Digital Scholarship Commons. And I've been able to really rely on them for developing these projects with my students. Now I should say as a caveat, I am really no media or technology expert. This is kind of taking me also out of my comfort zone a little bit. But I guess um, this is maybe what happens after tenure where you're like, let me push myself. I can be maybe more experimental. And so I really wanted to revisit my teaching in a, in a really substantive way. And I, I knew I wanted to engage in teaching a little bit differently. And so um, I started to really appreciate the ways in which I was understanding these media skills as essential and in company with critical thinking skills and with other research skills that we expect of our students. And so I started to see this kind of synergy coming together with all the skills I wanted students to acquire. So last summer, um, is it still on? Last summer I taught a course called Visualizing Human Rights. Is it okay? Um, Visualizing Human Rights. And this is where I first sought out the technical assistance of the Digital Scholarship Commons. Um, in previous versions of this course, there had been the media lab. So then students had a two-unit media lab uh, with the social science uh, division. But the closure of the lab put the course on hold. Um, but now with the emergence of the Digital Scholarship Commons, we could revisit that course. Um, and then I had to, you know, obviously collaborate there. Um, so I consulted actually with a colleague at a different university who uh, incorporated digital stories in her classroom, and I was fascinated by this um, project, and I th you know, asked her to share all her guidelines with me and, and kind of what were the objectives there. Um, and so she explained to me kind of what students gained from doing a digital story. And so then I said, hi, Rachel. I'm Silvana. Can we do a digital story for my class? And she said, sure, come on in. And so that's when Rachel and I met and became pals. And um, 
and I became sort of stunned at the level of technical assistance that they could offer myself and my students. And so then I said, well, you know, I think we can actually do this project. And, um, and, and do it, the project in a way where the students felt supported and, um, and empowered, really, to do this, to, to engage in this kind of final project. So not really knowing what to expect and kind of going into it a little bit with like, I really hope this does not blow up. I was utterly and pleasantly surprised by what the students were able to produce. And this is in a summer session, so five weeks. What they were able to do in five weeks to me was really, really stunning. Um, last quarter, I had students in my class do a podcast. And uh, I have to say, this was inspired by the fall symposium here. Um, where Mary Thomas from the History of Art and Visual Culture talked about her podcast assignment. And I said, I think I want to do that. That looks pretty amazing. And it was a lower division course. And it was a course in which I felt I could be a little bit experimental um, with the final projects. I'm like, oh, they're first and second years. You know, it's OK. I can, I, can, I can push them a little bit in a way. And again, completely floored at the output that the students did with the podcast. Um, and I think it taught me that students, when, even though they were all uncomfortable and they're all like, I've never done a podcast. I don't know what to do. They, they all rose to the occasion. And, um, and felt really proud of themselves in a way that's different than when they turn in a good final paper. Like now they could share the podcast with their families. Um, you know, I'm dealing with mostly first generation college students, so for them to be able to share something with their families is really important for them. And the students afterwards, you know, I said, well, it's the first time we've done a podcast, what do you think? And they just said, you know, they found it really challenging, far more challenging than they thought it was going to be, and not for the technical aspects necessarily. They actually found it more challenging because, um, differently challenging, I guess I should say, than a research paper, because they felt like they had to engage the scholarship and interpret the scholarship and interpret research findings in a way that's different than maybe pulling out large excerpts from a text or regurgitating the information. For them, they said, you know, I felt like I really, I really needed to understand what I was reading in another way because now I needed to explain it vis-a-vis -a, -vis a podcast. And so it encouraged them to de develop a different set of reading skills, I think, actually, and a different set of an an analytical skills for the purposes of doing this oral presentation uh, through the podcast. And you know, again, in retrospect, when I look back at that particular assignment, you know, it's a big experimental for myself and for them, but it really tapped into a creativity that I think sometimes gets lost um, when we don't push ourselves outside of our comfort zone. So again, I was really sort of taken with the ways in which they also wanted to be inventive and creative um, in doing this assignment. And, and they were pretty like pumped up about it too, which was really exciting to see. Um, so I say here are kind of some of my main takeaways uh, about experimenting with these uh, digital projects. Um, honestly, for me, they've brought a new life to my teaching. I think I myself had sort of fallen into a bit of a rut and a bit of a routine with my practice. And it just allowed me to kind of push myself in a way that I thought was really important for them. And they could feel the energy um, of the ways in which my own practice had changed um, with regards to these sort of new assignments I was trying. Um, and again, it, like kind of what I said earlier, it made me realize that in addition to writing skills, students need to become better prepared in presentation skills. And by this, I don't mean simply going in front of the classroom and doing a presentation, but really the logic of how do you orally present an argument or how do you make a compelling argument based on the evidence and scholarship you're referring to um, in front of a, a sort of an opaque audience. You don't really know who's going to hear it. Um, and to make these compelling arguments using scholarship, to make these compelling arguments by interpreting uh, critical, you know, ter interpreting readings, and then bringing it all together in some sort of logical structure um, was really, I think, an important skill for them to to nurture. And they started to realize that actually there's a whole, like there, like there's a logic and an organization to our research papers. There's an organization and a logic to putting um, together a podcast. And it's different than what we do for papers, but nonetheless, it requires them to, um, to be translators, to be, you know, uh, to, be, to be scholars of a different sort. And I, and I thought that was really beneficial for them. Um, Another takeaway is that I, when I said the students rise to the occasion, they really do when they something different. Um, and I think that was something that was also very 
rewarding for me to see as their teacher that they were very open to new methods, scared, but open nonetheless. And this is why they met and sort of surpassed my expectations in a, in a lot of ways. Um, and again, tapping into that creative potential uh, was to me probably a really, it was a really rewarding uh, aspect of it. And I think as professors and as TAs, it gives us a little bit of a change of pace. If we're in a social science or humanities uh, departments, when it comes to grading. And so this is not obviously to advocate that there should be no more papers, but it was nice to actually listen to a bunch of really creative podcasts and have that and grade that versus the paper. And it was really, um, there was something very enjoyable for me actually to view the digital stories um, rather than research paper. So for, even from, I, I don't think this will work for all of my classes, but the ones that I've done it in, it has worked really well. Um, and it's allowed me to get out of my own kind of teaching rut and to also kind of revitalize and be experimental um, with my teaching, which I think the students benefit from too. So uh, I want to begin by just sort of stepping back and noticing that something really remarkable is happening right now, which is that two faculty members are coming to talk about the future of the library, and both of them are talking about teaching and its relationship to the library, and that's really unthinkable. I mean, I've been here 20 years, and I never thought about <laughs> the library and my own practice of teaching. I might have thought about it as a place to go to have students helped with their assignments, uh, the very traditional kinds of assignments that I've been giving in literature courses. But I would say um, that the library right now is our teaching center on this campus uh, until I have a chance to actually build this one that I'm building. This is our teaching center and it is the, the institution on campus that has done more to support students and overhaul the educational mission as the rest of us have been scrambling to catch up and realize that we need an overhaul for our educational mission here. So I really wanna uh, just kind of give a bow to everybody at the library, not just for all the work that you're doing, but for the visioning that you're doing of what the needs are of our students in this time. I, I cannot uh, really imagine um, how much farther back I would be in trying to build a teaching center here. We are the only UC that doesn't have a teaching center. Uh, and um, so as of a year ago, we now have one, uh, but we're trying to build a 21st century teaching center, not a 13th century teaching center. Um, so I'd like to say that the library is the only 21st century institution at UCSC. Uh, and what I mean by that is that the library is a place that is really thinking holistically about problems related to teaching, learning, and, um, and in a way that really supports uh, faculty research, but also is trying to build creative connections between faculty research and the teaching and learning mission, not hold those things apart, which is the way most of us came through our careers. I do my research here, I do my teaching and learning here. So the question is, how can we have those things feed each other? Uh, particularly through some of the uses of space in the library. They are bringing together the integration of technology with embodied learning for our students in ways that no one else is. Our students don't have places to study. They don't have places to learn. We all know about what the housing pressures are on this campus. And the library has kind of stepped in to adopt that as one of its fundamental purposes. Uh, where are students gonna put their bodies so that they can learn and so that they can study and so that they can talk to each other? Um, and so in a way, a lot of the things that I would have had to advocate for uh, as uh, the founding director of a teaching center, I'm still going to have to advocate for, but I'm going to be able to point at the library and say, see how the library has got a head start on this for us. Um, so I've been really influenced in my connections with the library and with Elizabeth by thinking about integrated problem solving. I really have a deep experience with siloed problem solving after 20 years on the faculty. And now that I understand through um, some of the work that we've been doing this year, just how many different units on campus we need to get together to think about how to enhance or support the teaching and learning mission on campus, this has been the place where I've learned the most. Okay, so the library staff is at the forefront of a holistic approach to educational excellence at UCSC. There's, that, there's just no two ways about it. We don't have a study center at UCSC. We have somewhere between zero and one active learning classrooms. Uh, we have no collaborative learning spaces, and we have no contemplative center. 
<laughs> so the library is the place that has uh, made all of those things available. Um, and what I see as the kind of trajectory that's happening right now is a movement from thinking about uh, the consumption of knowledge and individual educational achievement to a triangle that I think of that comes partly out of talking with students about what they feel they need in order to learn, a triangle that goes contemplation, collaboration, and creation. And Silvana already talked about creation rather than regurgitation uh, as the model for, um, for knowledge production now. So contemplation, collaboration, and creation are not things that we're really set up to support right now at UCSC. And I really uh, hope to continue partnering deeply as I build this teaching center to learn from what the library has done and is doing. Because the future of teaching and learning at UCSC requires spaces, physical spaces, where contemplation, collaboration, and creation can happen. So that's point one, okay? Uh, second point, and there's only two, um, those of you who know me know that one of them has gone missing because there's always three, but there's only going to be two today because I'm the slow <laughs> professor trying to give a lightning talk. Um, <laughs> the scholarly work that I'm currently involved in is the scholarship of teaching and learning. Uh, and the scholarship of teaching and learning is relatively new to this campus. We have had remarkably little permeation of research on teaching and learning into the practice of those who teach on this campus at every level. Uh, and we haven't had much professional development either. So the scholarship on teaching and learning is largely invisible to those who teach and learn on this campus and yet is of interest to all of us uh, and is absolutely crucial to dealing with really the three large scale transformations in higher education that are impacting those of us who teach here right now whether we know it or not. One of those is demographic. Right? We have 42% first generation learners. If you add up first generation EOP and under, students from underrepresented groups, 75% of our student body. Most of those of us who teach here haven't given a lot of thought to how we might need to transform our classroom praxis to teach that population. Technology. That's number two, both the technology that we can use in our classrooms and the technology that's structuring our lives. Okay, and then third, this outpouring of research and scholarship on teaching and learning, <laughs> most people think of it under the title of active learning, but it goes far, far, far beyond that. And so one of my questions as the head of a new teaching center is how are we going to deliver access to research on teaching and learning and scholarship and teaching and learning. People ask me all the time, is your website ready yet? Your website that's going to be chock full of resources on teaching and learning? And my response to that is right now, I don't have time to build a website. And I definitely don't have skills to build a website. And we have an amazing library who specializes in the curation of information. Okay, so it seems to me that a natural alliance for us with the library would be to draw on the library's extraordinary skills at curation to produce a kind of information warehouse for all those who teach and learn on this campus about how to teach and learn more effectively. Right now, if you want to learn about the scholarship of teaching and learning, Mr. Google is the first place that you're going to go, okay, on this <laughs> campus. So the question is, how can we, um, how can we build an easily accessible, user-friendly, and um, sufficiently thorough warehouse of information that's easy for someone to go into who wants to say learn about syllabus design. I mean I've been designing syllabus, syllabi for almost 30 years but I've never actually read anything about how to design a syllabus. Okay, <laughs> Perfect replication model. Actually it turns out there's a lot of great information out there about how to design a syllabus. So I think you know for, for me another partnership that's going to be crucial with this library of the future is going to be as um, a guide for me in the curation of resources uh, so that I can support the people who teach here to teach the students that we have now with the tools that we have now. So really for me it's about contemplation collaboration, curation, and creation uh, as four things that I feel like the library um, knows how to do better than I do and can help me offer back to this uh, institution. So. Um, I think I'm going to go 
over there because I have slides. Just bear with me while I get them set up. I think it's still awake. Is it? Oh, yeah. Oh, wait. Did it? Okay. Yeah, I wanted to open my physical. Hi. 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 Hi.
So you can kind of see how Scalar allows you to interlay text and media alongside each other and also to annotate media. Um, so here is a page about his dolphin echolocation work. You can see the sonograph there with caption, um, some tapes, a photo of an experiment. It's a little difficult to show this in a screenshot, but um, basically there's text below this and then it allows you to go through a gallery. So he's holding a little baby lizard. This is Desert Ecology one, right? It's cute, that's why I put it at the top. <laughs> um, but you can slide through the gallery, and then when you go through the text, you can kind of connect back to the gallery. So it really creates these interesting opportunities for pairing text alongside media. And it doesn't have to be just photos, it could be videos, it could be maps, all that. So in thinking about my own research now, I'm thinking, okay, well, how can I use Scalar, right? So one component of the Scalar exhibit that Alex used in her portion was the mapping. <coughs> so you can actually overlay mapping into the Scalar exhibit so you can show the locations of points you're talking about. You can create pages that there are their own maps, but you can also use this map widget function that embeds the map in the page. So for me, you know, my work is looking at maps in a lot of ways. I'm thinking about here's the directions of storm systems, here's the directions of US military operations. And that's something that kind of gets lost when you just look at the static text of a dissertation. So now I'm thinking about, okay, well, how can I use the mapping feature of Scalar to really get my points across more? How could I translate my project into Scalar? Or how could I use Scalar as an addition to my dissertation? So those are possibilities that are opening up. And then secondly, and this is the last point of this talk, um, I want to focus on how Scalar has opened up opportunities for me in the classroom and in my pedagogy. So as Savannah and Jody were saying, you know, really thinking about how technology can push us and challenge us, you know, take us out of our comfort zone and push us in new directions for our teaching. So currently I'm teaching a Writing 2 course. And so that's a course, um, basically, it's like intro to writing at the university. So I have a lot of first and second year students, and I'm trying to teach them, okay, these are the different genres to work through. <clears throat> this is how you prepare yourself to work in college writing, right? And so my, the theme of my course is writing in place. So my students choose one local or semi-local, depending on what they want to do, place throughout the quarter. And they're writing all their assignments based on this place. So we have things like personal narrative, we have research essay, and all that. But now I'm building in Scalar. So I reached out to, to Rachel at the Digital Scholarships Commons to help me kind of figure out how I could use Scalar in the classroom. She's kindly done orientation with my students on how to use Scalar. And so now we're working through that and thinking about how we can use it as our final project. So for the final project for that class, I'm basically assigning them an exhibit through Scalar. So they're taking um, writing they've already done as a final portfolio. They're revising that and linking that to the Scalar exhibit as Google Docs. But then they're creating their own exhibit, and the exhibit is going to be like a, like a larger theme about their place. So that's like the path in the exhibit. And they're dividing that into three dis discrete components, which are the pages in the exhibit. And I'm asking them to synthesize material, to kind of analyze, to add in new content, and to add in media, right? So they're getting playful with media, they're adding in memes, videos, YouTube videos, all that, right? So I wish I could show you things more concrete than this, but we're literally in the process of making the exhibits, so nothing is presentable at this moment in time, because we're in week nine. Um, but I just wanted to give a sense of how working with Scalar in the classroom has allowed me to kind of be creative and the types of um, teaching activities I'm thinking of. So this one, this lovely board work you can see, I basically assigned groups, this is like a mini like hypothetical exhibit activity. I assigned groups hypothetical places on campus. You can see one of them is McHenry Library, right? Um, and so then they had to decide, okay, in your group, plan an exhibit for this site. How would you do that? What would be the path? What would be the pages? How would you mix genre? And so they came up with some really interesting approaches and in thinking about how to mix genres, how to really divide different content to a more accessible user, user base. So this was an interesting example. I'm also having them look at already published Scalar exhibits and they're doing critical reading responses on them. We're working through them in class and they're saying, okay, like I like the layout here, but I think this genre could be better transitioned. So it's provided a really critical a very productive, critical moment for them. Kind of think about new genres, right? So we're talking about you know, what kind of genres can be included in an exhibit? What kind of apparatus does the exhibit provide to kind of transition us through genres? Right, so like through the pages, how does that kind of move us through different genres? And how can we think of an exhibit itself as its own discrete genre? So that has been really productive for a writing class. So I am hoping that the projects come out well. I will keep you posted. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. Thank you.
Let's minimize that. And I don't know if anyone's been to the uh, Ken Norris Reserve in Cambria, but it's worth a visit. It's gorgeous. That's awesome. Oh, I'm glad it was auto-saved. That's scary. I'm just going to save it again. So I'm here to share my experiences with working with faculty, partnering with them with research. And um, it's really more of a story. So um, I, hope it's more, I hope it's more interesting that way too. Um, and I just want to say right from the very beginning that the activities that I'm going to describe could not have been done without the willingness and help and work of many different people throughout the library. And you know where you are and lightning talks are not conducive to attribution, so forgive me if I, if I miss you specifically. Um, so signs like this are common um, around the country, and I still identify as a librarian very strongly with this sign. Um, but I'd like to tell you a different story about um, <laughs> questions and how they can be different. Around 2006, UCSC uh, approved a game design major. It was the first of its kind in the UC system. And the faculty member who was key in founding the, the major, uh, Jim Whitehead, came to the library and asked us, what if students had access to a broad collection of games that they could use for study in the library? So we were intrigued by this. Um, and, and also, you know, excited by the proposition, but we also realized that this was going to be thorny. Any kind of non-traditional um, collection is going to have a lot, of, a lot of challenges. So, but we worked together with the faculty to come up with funding, um, figure out loan periods, um, how games could be stored, how uh, games could be cataloged. These are all huge issues, but we were able to have the collection, have a game lab, and it's been um, an extremely popular and useful thing for students to have. And games are now something many libraries have. Um, we were on the cutting edge. This is an example of a talk given at the Game Developers Conference by one of the professors who was bragging about how integrated the game lab was with the library itself. So a few years pass, and the games program matured into a top-ranking program. Um, and I was asked, what if the library could provide mobile games to students? And one of the first games we made available was actually a game designed by UCSC students um, called Suzy G. And it was also the first game anywhere to use multi-touch um, space shooter type mechanics for the iPad. But in this experience, it was really exciting for me to actually have something that was created by students in the collection. Um, and what year was this? 2012, maybe? So um, it was a fairly new concept. And it made me think how much game creation is happening on this campus as a research object. And um, what role does the library play in, in helping figure out where these software objects are in the long run. So at about the same time, um, Noah Wardrop Fruin, who is a professor here in computational media, back then um, computer science, introduced me to Henry Lowood, who is a curator at Stanford Libraries and also um, a, a games researcher and was focused on the preservation of commercial games. And uh, we also met Eric Kaltman, who was a new grad student who was also interested in these topics. So as we talked, we formed our thoughts into a grant application where we asked, what if we could preserve research games? And what would the best practices be? And this resulted in our first grant um, from the National Endowment of Humanities, um, Office of Digital Humanities. Um, and it went really well. You can read our white paper. It's in e-scholarship. A plug for e-scholarship. <laughs> But as we discussed the process of games research, we also realized that the scholarly communication infrastructure for the discipline was very nascent. 
There, uh, as far as discovery of games, it was very difficult. Um, the description of games was all over the place. Um, the, the citation practices, even within the discipline, were not standard. And so um, we often talked about it in relationship to film. You know, if, if we had, if we could have had done this conversation with film 50 years ago, where would this film studies be now? So we decided to um, ask, what if we could work on the infrastructure of scholarly communication for game studies? So we invited a large expert. Remember, we said if you go after big grants, it has to be interdisciplinary. You have to have a large number of people. So we started to um, enlarge our group. We got metadata experts primarily from UCSC and Stanford. And um, locally, that was Marsha Barrett and um, Rachel Jaffe. And we um, got to work and the contributions were significant. We were able to create the first uh, control vocabulary for platforms and media, essentially games hardware. This had never existed before, and we're still working on the interface so that it, people don't have to navigate open metadata registry. I do not wish this on anybody. Mm -hmm. So we'll be finishing that up this summer. And we also have vector drawings and took pictures, actually, um, archival picture photographs of as many media and um, consoles as we could get our hands on. Because if you think about a cataloger who's, who doesn't know anything about games, you want these games to be accurately and consistently described. Because in the future, the only way these are going to be usable is if you have the accuracy to begin with. It's part of the archival process. So the grad students also worked on discovery games. And we talked a little bit about discovery earlier. And I really feel like they are hitting on the next gen discovery methods that will happen. So they were really interested in serendipitously discovering games based on similar games. And they came up with um, GameSage and um, primarily GameSpace, which, is, um, which ha uses uh, natural language processing, but also um, machine learning, which I think really represents the future of discovery for serendipitous discovery layers. And then they also created a citation tool. And this one was given the name, let's see, Game and Interactive Scholarship Toolkit to help with the complicated problem of citing performance, especially computational performance, and then being able to capture the relevant metadata with it. So all of these projects and the findings we had generated a lot of interest around the country and um, some international interest as well. There were numerous grad students supported financially and um, other students supported pedagogically and uh, the research for an emerging area was supported. I think um, if the faculty had not approached us with his initial what if, and if that conversation wasn't nurtured over time, it would have been a loss. So I just want to encourage all the researchers out here to please ask us the what if questions. We are happy to help. Thank you, and I really, I was taken by how what um, our panelists were talking about this afternoon, how it really meshed with what folks were talking about this morning, and really kind of helping us visualize what that really looks like, all of some of the things that, that folks were talking about. So let me just ask, are there questions that people have for, I'm going to take this, can I take this off? Um, questions that people have for the panelists? Anything? So I have a question. So uh, how about that? Um, so <laughs> Silvana and Danielle, when they were talking, they talked about how coming into kind of a new environment with new <clears throat> kind of tools at their fingertips to learn, that they were really challenged in ways that they hadn't anticipated. And then um, Jody was talking about how she envisions a space where you have a space for contemplation, collaboration and creation all around by a massive collection of beautifully curated things. And so how do you, how does what you guys talked about, how does that fit with what Jody was saying? 
How do those things come together? You, you can take it away. Do it. <laughs> well, I feel like um, now I have new skills. Uh, that's part of the curation. So I think it's also allowed me actually to connect with colleagues across the campus. Um, for instance, you know, I, like I said, for the podcast project, I consulted pretty widely with Mary Thomas. Um, I'm like, Mary, sh you know, please talk to me and tell me what I'm like, what do I need to do here? And what are the, some of the lessons you learned? So it allowed me actually to feel um, connected to colleagues in different divisions that I hadn't felt before. Um, but in terms of the, of the curation, I feel like now I can do a podcast assignment. I know what works. And I have these new skills at my disposal. And now I podcast like crazy. So I'm now, you know, I do, I do it myself. Yeah, I think it's really significant to see that for Silvana, it starts with um, communicating with colleagues. Mm -hmm. Uh, people who share your experience in the classroom and who may just say in passing, like, oh, yeah, I do this thing in my class, and you think, you do what in your class? Mm -hmm. uh, and then to know that the library is presently the resource um, most, the resource center most likely to be able to support you. People tell me with total conviction all the time uh, that they would like to adopt technology in their classes, but there is no one on the UCSC campus. There are people on the UCSC campus who can help them learn how to use specific technologies once they've identified them as the technologies they want to use, but there isn't anyone who can help them go in and really rethink their teaching practice uh, and even imagine, right? I'm a professor of 17th century poetry. I would have said for a long time, what does technology have to do with my teaching, right? And now I know people uh, around here who can help me think about that in really sophisticated ways. So I think there's first there's the connections with colleagues, then there's knowing that this is where the expertise is on campus. We have an instructional designer, we have a Rachel Deblinger, we have, you know, we have people uh, who, and Aaron Zachmeyer, Rachel Deblinger, and lots of other people who can help uh, with these, you know, and that the, and that the library is the place where you're most likely to get that kind of support. So I think that's part of it. I think also it's important to remember that for many, many of us, and myself included until a year ago, the bar is unbelievably low. Uh, it's not even that most of us don't know what technologies we might be able to use in the classroom, but many of us don't know that there is scholarship on teaching and learning that might be helpful to us. So I see that as the connection, right? I see that as the point of connection between specific praxis and that opening into a world of what it's possible to do in our classrooms that many of us uh, don't even know exists. So, so Daniel, when, when Jody invents her space, uh, is it going to work for you? I think so, yeah. I mean, for my students right now, we're in social sciences too, and the internet's kind of funky. So we'll be doing stuff on Scalar together, and then all of a sudden we'll just get like, kicked off the internet, that kind of stuff. So it would be really helpful to have a space where they can actually go to a computer lab, or where they don't have to rely on their own laptops. I have some students who have like broken keyboards, so they have to rent laptops from the library. Um, but for me, um, just going back to that curation question, I think it, it is cyclical, because doing the CART program, that kind of allowed me to see, OK, like I didn't know anything about Scalar. So then we were working with Rachel already for Scalar. That allowed me to see what Scalar could do. And then going back to teaching, you know, then I knew that I could consult the Digital Scholarship Commons and talk to Rachel about putting that into my classroom. And then now, like, in moving forward, um, you know, I'm already thinking about, okay, well, how could I use Scalar for other classes? I'm teaching a class on climate change and literature in the fall, and I'm thinking, should I use Scalar again? Or maybe I should do a podcast. But I know that those resources are available at the library for me to come to when I need them. So um, the, morning, the morning crew, could you have helped these guys? Not to put you on the spot. So, uh, is, uh, so we heard about Jeffrey and, and uh, your, your space at UC Berkeley. And, so, and three of the words that came up that somebody said was collision, spontaneity, serendipity. These were words that kept coming up. And then we have these other, the four C words. So how do all these things intersect? Did, you, do you, did this resonate with you? Could you have helped the faculty do podcasts and, and, and Mackenzie's nodding her head? Yeah. I think we do, but as the need becomes clearer and the plethora of tools and opportunities continues to grow, how should we think about priorities? You know, who should be 
deciding which of the 10,000 scholarly production tools we could support, we will support, right? And because um, <laughs> I know we struggle with that at Davis, you know, we're also supporting a number of the things you talked about, maybe not the specific tools, but in general. But I can just see the tsunami, right? And so far, it's been the first in the door. You came first, so we helped you. But we're quickly reaching the limits of that. So what do you think about how we might set some priorities? Are there disciplinary approaches? Are there types of expertise, tools? What do you think? You look like you wanted to take it. Well, I mean, I will just say I'm, I'm, uh, I'm always amazed by how little we talk to each other. Um, I mean, really completely blown away by the silo thing about which I had heard, but which I had not experienced to this extent. <clears throat> so I wonder if you uh, have people from different disciplines come in and you know, constitute a kind of learning community for you that considers that question. You know, and it has to be the people who are actually in the classrooms uh, and a nice mix of people like me who've never even used a slide in a classroom and have a really spot on 12th century pedagogy uh, mixed, you know, with people who are using, you know, really advanced tools because I think you need to be able to, you need to be able to respectfully address all of us uh, and you need to get input from all of us because I think a lot of us, as I like to think of us, late adopters, uh, are, are people who haven't yet had a compelling enough argument for why we would want to transform our pedagogy. Uh, and you know, and there are going to be there are going to be there's going to be a huge range. So I think just getting getting people in the door and getting them to talk to each other. I've heard a lot this year because I've been hanging around here a lot. Uh, that it's not it's not that it, that that people in the library feel like it's hard uh, to have figure out how to reach faculty. And I kind of feel like I don't know. You could try asking. Is anybody interested in being in a conversation about how we decide which technologies are available for classroom use at UCSC and see what you get? You know, you might find that there are really interested people out there. Question here. Oh, well, I would just kind of add to that also that one. Yeah, okay. So one of the things, is Aaron here? Aaron, are you here? No. Oh, so one of the things that Aaron and I found when we were working with faculty to create new assignments was we were really open, like whatever tool you want to bring and I think what we found was that a lot of the faculty didn't bring tools with them that they brought ideas with them and then we helped them figure out yes. what the right tool was and so that as we helped pair people with the right tool we developed material that would help support and so actually we were worried about scaling things up but it we anticipate that it won't be as hard as we thought it would be because we helped uh, Silvana and actually two other instructors after Mary create podcasting assignments and now we have templates. So if someone says, I want to build a podcast, mm -hmm. we have these templates already made. So we don't have to do as much hand-holding or support for that kind of assignment so that we can turn and help Danielle do something with Scalar which we've never brought into the classroom before. So that um, it's actually the word of mouth that this is a place to come and have those conversations I think has been more important than leading with any kind of technology or tool or list of what's available for support. So um, going back to Mackenzie's question and a comment that we heard earlier today was wh where do you invest? We, you know, resources are limited, unfortunately, in public education. Um, and who has metrics? How do you, do you develop metrics for success when you go into these um, courses? And, and also, coming back to our morning speakers, do you have metrics? Did the gate counts go up at Moffitt Library? Um, so just a little bit of thought about that. I mean, met at least from my class, there's no like concrete metric other than like I want to teach them how to write in different contexts, right, for a writing class. Um, so for my objectives are one, they understand the assignment, that they're not like, what the heck is this? I don't understand why we're doing this. I don't want them walking away like that. And I also want them to walk away, I think, like Silvana was saying, I think it is important for them to walk away with something to show. When later on, you know, the exhibit right now is only visible to myself and my student. But later on, they can publish that and make that publicly accessible. And that's a decision that they can choose later on if they want to. So it's the idea of having a portfolio that they can take outside of the classroom and use in, for other purposes. Yeah. yeah. 
So I wouldn't say I have formal metrics, but I think, um, again, Mary Thomas uh, was my sort of cons you know my sort of co colleague uh, consultation. So I really drew from the evaluation rubric she used, and I had her explain to me why those were the evaluation rubric she used. Um, but I think this is where you know just sort of uh, affirm what Jody was saying in, in terms of us needing to sort of speak to one another. A lot of times um, these evaluation uh, rubrics uh, assignments they're there. We just don't know it because we're not or in silos, and so, um, so I don't have, I wouldn't say I have, I think those metrics will become clearer to me as I continue embarking in these new um, techniques, but for now, I really just sort of rely on in consultation with, with Rachel and with, in this case, Mary, for the podcast. Right. And I okay. think, you know, as much as I, uh, have, you know, understand and, and even have grudgingly become a supporter of metrics, uh, Part of what we're talking about here is not really trackable by any metric. So we're talking about a rhizomatic uh, spread of a transformation in thinking about teaching on this campus. And there are people in this room from whom I've already learned just by showing up at you know one of Rachel's uh, pr you know presentations here, the faculty who did this. We can't track that. And so I feel like we need to hold ourselves to high standards of assessment and tracking, and we also need to relax a little bit around assessment and tracking and know that the scale of transformation that is happening and needs to happen on this campus is not one that we're going to be able to count at the end of every year. We're just not. And so can we can we loosen that a little bit and think as much about how we get people interested in this transformation, how we even point out to them that there might be a need for a transformation in, in what we're doing around here. And that we're not gonna be able to measure until a little ways down the road. Right, so it sounds like there's a little bit of a tightrope to walk and so Gildas has a question. Uh, Gilda Hamel from History uh, Emeritus. I have a general question to the panels this afternoon and also the panels this morning. And it's a, a feeling I have that the fix it, fixity versus mobility of learning is in play. It, uh, I, I study very ancient history all the time. And of course, the tablets of Mesopotamia interest me. And the books look like they are fixed when in fact they can be looked at as very mobile. Indeed. Whereas a tabletop machine is a, or a building, however a gateway it is, or an open space, particularly libraries that usually has large scale stairways and ready-made glass panels and things like that. I mean, I was struck by the pictures this morning of Moffitt the third and fourth floor, and the glass in it, and the plexiglass, and so forth. All of this may, I'm just asking, I'm just putting it as a question. It looks to me terribly fixed still. It looks transparent uh, in the interest of what is happening in modern acquisition of knowledge, or development of knowledge, and self-development. But at the same time, I think there is a danger in thinking that this is more mobile than it really is. It's really as fixed as the books before. And so I would, I just asking that as a question. I'm, and I'm, I'm I would like to tie to it the, the, the question about capitalism and capitalist forces that was asked this morning by you, which is that I don't know what the dynamic is going to be. And I was very interested to hear this morning that say, Sci Hub or open, uh, uh, um, uh, open source was, was kind of leverage, at least we could leverage those things in getting better deals from bundlers and publishers. But I am personally very worried that actually publishers are now in the business of renting knowledge out and that actually the broader public will not have access to it, except when, not, because of a reason of security, uh, having the VPN or whatever that will be. So it becomes actually also very fixed knowledge. And it could be narrowly constructed. And I think it's an important question to consider. That, uh, so 
out of that question it comes the question of what is the role of space? How much space is needed when everything is gone mobile and will pr presumably, I suspect, be even more mobile in the few years that come? Excellent question. So another word to add or a few words to add to our mobile being one of them. Does anyone want to respond to observation, the question? It does get back to my question to you, because I, I'm faced with the same question when I talk about how we could transform space, and it's how do you keep up, right? You know, especially for the fixed kinds of infrastructure that we were just hearing about. It's one thing with software, but it's another thing when you've made a big investment in physical infrastructure that will be out of date in two years. So that gets back to my question about priorities, because I agree, we don't want to be bean counters and, and quell the love right away, but we do need ways to think about how to choose, especially when we're committing to maintaining that infrastructure for some time. So separating physical from virtual infrastructure, can, can you think about, you know, you talked about putting together kind of advisory groups of coalition of the willing type people, which is a great idea. But again, you know, are there rubrics or parameters or criteria we could think about for where to start making tough choices? I mean, I think the only, and this is a little bit to Shidlan as well, I'm not sure that uh, the kinds of physical space transformations that we're talking about are gonna be out of date in two years. I can't speak to the technology side, uh, but I can say, you know, I'm sure it was a significant pain in the butt to go from what what came before to the codex, uh, and I am a book historian. Um, but, but we got a good 700 years, uh, you know, out of the printed codex, and it's not done yet. Um, so I, I feel a little bit as though um, I don't want to be stopped by the worry that if we make, you know, you have, I mean, I don't need to tell you guys this, you have your incremental change and then you have major shift. And we're, we are in paradigm shift for higher education right now. We are absolutely in paradigm shift. And, you know, the form realm uh, is, uh, is hostile to deep-seated transformation, but once it can get with deep-seated transformation, then it will become hostile to transformation again and we'll get to stay there for a while. So I feel pretty sanguine about <laughs> um, advocating for really courageous rethinkings of how we use educational space. Uh, in the 20 years that I've been here, the spaces that we have that were built you know, 50 years ago, have not really been working for even what un unreconstructed professors like myself uh, have been doing. Um, so it seems to me that we, uh, one of the de-siloings is, you know, and I know Jim Phillips is, is here, um, one of the de-siloings is to really get the people who teach on this campus to be in the conversations about what kind of spaces for teaching we're building on this campus. <laughs> you know, which again, we haven't done that. And it's like, well, by the way, what do you guys do in your classes? You know, probably a good conversation to have. I spoke with an architect recently who's involved in uh, building a new, um, is a UC alum building a new auditorium that's also going to double as an active learning space but he told me he knew he didn't even know what that phrase meant you know and I thought wow we need to have better conversations you know so. yeah on the I wanted to go back to the mobility and question about space and I guess first of all of course we are we, we need to work towards a much more mobile world, and we do in a lot of ways. Indeed, I'm pretty sure that the number one complaint we get at Berkeley uh, at the library is not about books we move to remote storage, and it's not about the fact that we allow coffee in some of our spaces. The number one complaint we get is when the VPN goes down because everybody's working somewhere other than Berkeley, uh, somewhere other than campus, and certainly somewhere other than the library, and they want access to resources. But in, in designing space, which of course is in a fixed location, uh, when we are doing that, I, I don't, we haven't been thinking about mobility as much as flexibility. It's partly this, how do we be ready for the future? We'd be ready for the future by not tying ourselves to the present. Mm. Um, so, uh, you know, all of the furniture on wheels are mobile and uh, movable. Um, having everything, having, partitions because people want 
to cluster themselves, but either having those partitions mobile or having them be not very confined, not very many rooms, but more uh, carved out spaces, and allowing the students and the faculty maximal freedom to do whatever they want in that space and be creative and change it and adapt it over time. So when we're talking about building labs and studios, we're not talking about closed labs and closed studios. Those are all themselves flexible open spaces that we figure will be reconfigured every few years, and I think, I think that's pretty important. But what we don't know, we want to be flexible in part because we don't know. We don't know what the future is going to bring. But the question I want to bring to uh, uh, you all and others um, is we all agree about the wonderful opportunities and the tremendous things that come out of serendipity and discovery and mixing together people and ideas. But how do we actually design, whether it be spaces or courses or other activities, to make more of that happen? Um, you know, we all say we want to do that and we think, well, if we bring everybody together, but and often, you know, often when you create a nice space, people flood into it to work by themselves. You know, it's still in, in our Moffat Library, which is designed to be maximally flexible and collaborative and it's noisy and people can bring food in uh, and coffee in. Nonetheless, an awful lot of the work is still individual solo work, which is fine, but we have other spaces for that. How do we get the serendipity to happen, to get people to talk to each other? It's just saying tear down the walls doesn't actually tear down the silos. So any response to that? And Christy, you know, one, one thing I wanted to just kind of dovetail on that, I think that you were a vanguard when um, with the gaming things and then all of a sudden people didn't want to stay in the library anymore. They wanted to be mobile with their laptops and, and I think kind of going back to um, some of the comments if you want to. Well, when Jeffrey said today that students um, need simultaneous access to technology, information, and people, it struck me that that's my job now as liaison librarian to, to make that possible and make that happen. And it's not necessarily designing a fixed space where that can happen. It might mean reaching out to people and making the connections that they can't make because they don't have the bird's eye view that I am lucky enough to have. Right, and so right. that, that's what came up to me right away. Right. So anyone else want to respond to some of the things? Jody? You know, that's why, I mean, I told you why a teaching center needs a library. That's why a library needs a teaching center. Because if we can't get away from the model of individual educational achievement as the only model in higher education, uh, then people won't talk to each other. Um, and so we all have to be thinking and doing our own work that's collaborative. I mean, I think about Danielle having done this really interesting exhibit with a student that I work with, two, putting two things together that you might not think of as going together, right? And I don't know, I thought maybe you could talk about that collaborative, because it's not as though any of us look at that and we're like, well, Danielle didn't really do the work, you know? <laughs> right? We look at it and we think, wow, look what our students can do when we let them talk to each other. Yeah. So. Um, well, Alex was back there, so she worked on the exhibit with me, so maybe she could speak to that as well, but. Um, <laughs> Yeah, we collaborated on the exhibit. I mean, it was a great experience because we were able to kind of think through intersections between the Lick Observatory and Norris Archive, like you were saying. Um, wasn't necessarily super apparent, but um, I think that collaborative process was really enriching for all three of us. I just have a really quick comment. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's okay. So I think, you know, sometimes when we're thinking about how to operate in silos, we don't even, we need to kind of start with our own departments. You know, like I'm even struck by departments have not, sufficiently had these conversations around what are you doing in your class? What are you reading? What are, what are you, what's new with you? So instead of getting overwhelmed with like, we must talk to everybody across UC Santa Cruz, if we could start with the department and then another department and then maybe the division, you know, you can just sort of scale up and I think that would be a breakthrough, you know, um, in, in the way we engage in pedagogical practice. So strategy. Yes. Okay. We have to prioritize Thanks, Trish. I'm Debbie Murphy, I'm one of the librarians here, and one of the things that strikes me about this conversation is we're talking about a physical space, a building, and in many ways, that seems so, it's just gonna sound terrible, that seems so small in many ways compared to this inner space, this amazing, this universe that keeps expanding at a rate, a phenomenal rate of the information and the way you figure out what's where. And really, that is so, huge and when we work with especially those young to research undergraduates giving them a sense of that space you look at the library website we have a virtual as well as a physical presence and in many ways although the website looks 
an inch deep. It can be a million feet deep, depending on where you look. So we're struggling with not just the physical manifestation and sense of space and place that a library embodies, but also the very nature of what it means to be a library and a librarian. And it's, it's an area that they are, they work in sympathy with each other. So I put out to you, especially my colleagues at Berkeley, um, kind of that sense of how to convey the inner as well as the virtual, the virtual as well as the physical space and how they connect. Anybody want to respond? Here we go. <laughs> Not a response. Sorry, Debbie. <laughs> but I was thinking about what you said about how do you bring people and how do you pro um, provide the context and the kind of the human infrastructure for engaging in meaningful collision conversations. Um, and I think there's so many people on this campus and on every campus that are working to do that and um, recognizing the expertise that non-faculty members bring to providing knowledge spaces and opportunities for engagement is a really important way of uh, bringing those conversations to the fore and um, respecting and acknowledging the various expertise that exists on a college campus is one way to, I think, enhance those kinds of conversations. Elizabeth. Well, so back to the um, metrics comment, our gate counts when we opened McHenry Library went up 75% in the first quarter it was reopened. 75%. And so, you know, there were people that were never, you know, using this library. I never worked in the old library. I came when we were all crammed in the renovation side and then there was this great opening. And 75% is huge, you know, and we don't, I mean, I don't even know how to count it anymore. I look at our user services people. It's just gigantic. And so what we're finding is there's such a demand for that kind of collaborative space. And I, we do see what you're talking about happening all the time. People running into each other that don't expect it. I mean, it sounds corny, but food really makes a difference. <laughs> you know, having the cafe here has made a huge difference. And so when we look to the science and engineering library, there's such a demand and kind of clamoring for that kind of experience that that's what we think about. Okay, another question back here. Thanks for the great talks. Um, as we were talking, the question was raised like, why haven't faculty been interested in research on teaching or why aren't they aware of the new stakes in teaching the paradigm shift? I was thinking like among the problems are fear of standardization, fear of assessment and metrics. Like a lot of people I think maybe particularly in humanistic disciplines, are like, I don't want to be a part of that conversation. I don't want to do it. I don't want to add new things to my syllabus. I just don't want to be a part of it. And I'm, and I'm wondering about how to chip away at that sensibility while also respecting the, the critical concern there about the problems that come with standardization and me measurement upon measurement and data-driven cultures around teaching. But I think another aspect of this, and we're talking a lot about space, about like what keeps faculty from going to make these kinds of switches and seeking out people is the dimension of time. Yep. It's really a huge part of it, which is the perception that doing this is going to require too much of my time so I can't do it. And I feel like, you know, this is my first year as a faculty member here, I am ever on the watch for my own time. It's like a deep part of my own practice is assessing the time that different things will take and being aware of what I can and can't commit. It's just like, and I, but I think that's true of the contemporary world. People are increasingly time conscious and it's just uh, proving to somebody that what you're proposing to them is worth their time is a huge aspect of things. And so I was struck with the Digital Scholarship Commons. I think your poster points out that it doesn't take much time to work with us. And I think that matters. I really think that matters. But I think it's a little more complicated than just it's not gonna take much time. I think it's also um, providing structured time. So what was great in working with DSC was in the fall, we were brainstorming. In the winter, we were doing our experiment. And in the spring, we were kind of thinking about it and sharing that with the community. And that kind of structuring made it feel like a research process, right? And it also just gave it a kind of a cognitively manageable structure. And I just feel like that's a dimension of 
of what we're talking about here. And then I just also think that libraries are wonderful because they hold on to deep time. They hold on to ancient time. And I think that's a, as I was walking through the stacks, I was thinking a lot about that, right? Mm -hmm. So anyway. So I think that's another kind of a strategy is of having, uh, putting some parameters around things so you know how much time and resources it's gonna take. And also, I mean, I'm not gonna, uh, when you were talking, I was thinking about the promotion and tenure mm -hmm. sp space about, you know, do some of these things, how does that fit into kind of the whole promotion and tenure uh, uh, realm, et cetera. So I think that's another thing to think about. Because you're fully tenured, I think you said. No, no, no. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm tenured. I'm, right. I'm not full, though. I'm not a full professor. Right. But I, you know, I did, I did mention that in the beginning that I started to experiment post-tenure. Because I think I was thinking, like, oh, it's going to take too much time. It surprisingly doesn't take as much time. But I think the one thing I that sort of unburdened me in terms of the time question was realizing I didn't have to think about everything on my own and do everything on my own. And so, you know, this is why I sort of approached Rachel so early um, with like, I think I, this is what I want to do. How can we make this happen? And it sort of alleviated any burden that I would have to learn all of these new technologies, which I said in the offset, I'm not a tech person. Um, but it there was an alleviation there once I was able to see teaching as not just my individual job, I could think about it as a more collaborative and collective. That, granted, I'm the professor on the catalog, but I didn't have to do all of the envisioning and labor myself. Right. So, um, as Kyle perfectly well knows, I could answer this question for the rest of the time that we have. <laughs> um, because that really, I mean, you, you've named all the things that um, come in when you start a new teaching center, uh, and just a few things that I would say is you don't um, you don't pitch your teaching center to mid to late career Senate faculty. That's not who it's for. Uh, they don't have we don't have time, and we're quite set in our ways. Um, so there's a kind of beautiful trickle up, uh, and also you focus on the gates. So you uh, address yourself to new faculty. One of the things that I'm gonna be proposing is that we uh, put professional development in people's startup packages. Um, because we don't do that and it would be a wonderful way to incentivize it. Um, and obviously we are doing a lot uh, with the graduate division uh, and also with non-Senate faculty. So you don't address mid to late career Senate faculty, although it's wonderful that we have people who do that. Um, you do things in bite sizes, right? You don't try to completely overhaul somebody's pedagogy. And for those of you who teach, and everyone in here in some sense teaches, I, if I can recommend one book to you. It's uh, a book called Small Teaching that just came out, which, which limits itself to things that you can do in your class tomorrow. Uh, and it boils down all the neuroscience research and all the learning research, uh, and then it gives you bite-sized things that you can do tomorrow. So you pitch at bite size, uh, and then the last thing I'll say is a big focus of ours this year has been on studying um, the other measures aside from student evaluations of teaching. For the teaching portion of the promotion and tenure, everyone is required to have at least one on other measure. And if you do five other measures, then you've just diluted the racist, sexist, homophobic student evaluation of teaching customer satisfaction survey. Uh, and part of those other measures is that you can write about how you have used something like the digital center to enhance your pedagogy. And that is recognized as having made an effort. So professional development becomes a part of your self-representation as someone who's attempting to transform your labor. I said that I didn't want to build anything that would make people more effective without also making them more efficient uh, in this teaching center. So we're trying to do offerings within the space of department meetings and trying to make them uh, have an eye towards uh, labor and time saving because, you know, it's very hard to talk on this campus about the experience of the people who teach here. Uh, we, talk, we don't talk about it. We're sort of a little ashamed to talk about it. But everyone else is in crisis, but not the faculty. So part of my job is to say, hey, guess what? Faculty's in crisis. So how can we give the faculty support, resources, and advocacy that they haven't received uh, to do their job better? So. so I have a question about a different crisis. Um, as I was listening to the presentations, um, I was struck by the transformation of the sort of outwardness of the assignments, a podcast and you know an exhibition, and as you said, 
Right now, the exhibitions are inward facing to your own students, but they could go public. And um, my experience has been that part of the silofication of disciplines has been, um, you know, uh, achieved by the kinds of assignments that we give that are incredibly internal, private, solitary, solipsistic, right? And you move toward this model of collaborative, outward facing assignments for students. And that's great. Um, that also raises the possibility of plagiarized work. And I don't know how many people saw the story in the New York Times over the weekend about the code problems, how students are plagiarizing code from one another. Um, I'm, I'm kind of wondering if the library can play a role there with the kind of, and I'm sure Jody, you're, you know, this is something you've been thinking about too, but plagiarism, the, the navigation that students are having to um, do around their own work, others' work, sharing work, that, that kind of thing. Comment? Does the library want to take that on? <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> take it on. We, we have talked in our instruction sessions numerous times about plagiarism. There's, there's been, um, I'm sure, a libguide somewhere someone created about plagiarism. I think a bigger topic also is just ethics and scholarly communication. The ethics of attribution, for instance. And um, it, it could be its own one unit course, frankly, and probably should be for some people. Um, but yeah, the library would, would love to take that on and have a purpose, have a place to put it. So that's another thing, you know, you ask us what if, we will, we will partner with you and try to deliver something. Just add a quick comment. We talk a lot about the need for stepping up our game in information literacy education for our students. Something I occasionally point out, but I'm a little bit quieter about is, our faculty need it too. And I'm a faculty member, I say that, but faculty need to know how to operate better in a world where plagiarism is different and easier than it used to be. And you know, there are ways to deal with it, but we, and we as librarians in our librarian roles can help educate the faculty on this too. I mean, I'm del I was delighted to find when I came to Berkeley and became a librarian that our librarians help faculty write assignments and actually give them advice on what works and what doesn't work. Terrific service and a terrific way to teach the faculty what they need to know in this world too. Yeah, I mean, I would also say from an instructional point of view, I'm not convinced that plagiarism is uh, harder now. Um, I, I mean, is easier now. I think plagiarism might be harder now. Uh, I mean, I work with um, teaching assistants who can find out whether someone plagiarized in an instant, which wasn't possible, you know, when I started doing this. So, um, but I just really want to second the notion of an ethics of attribution. I mean, one of the bene one of the things that I really like about professional development is that it is a strengths or affirmative based model. And if we acknowledge that we're all indebted to each other and talk about what is the most ethical way to recognize those debts, we get out of the punitive discourse. I mean, I'm an intellectual property scholar, that's what I do. And I feel like the, the problem is not to come up with better ways of punishing people. It's to actually raise people up to understand that we're all indebted all over the place. And if we would just acknowledge that, we could get rid of this problem like that, right? So, just my name. I just wanted to echo what Jody was saying about the research on teaching and learning. There's a lot of research on information literacy and, and plagiarism, as well. And I'm currently um, engaged in a project with Aaron Zachmeyer, who's um, with the uh, the Siddle. <laughs> I wanted to give it the old name, but. Um, and um, the assessment director, uh, assistant director of assessment on campus, um, which in which we've created a tool that helps students. So I think um, it's, it's just like one layer of addressing that question. Um, and we're working with faculty, but I, I think what I'm just trying to say is that there are, um, not only is it the library that, the, or like an individual librarian who can help with this, I think that it's also looking at what are the problems and sort of thinking about, um, Again, like what what are the the problems that students are struggling with, and trying to address it that way? I think one of the ways that we've worked on this question was to think about how faculty describe the problems that they're seeing. So beginning with that question, and then yes. thinking about well, what kind of tool can be an intervention without deploying a bunch of people to try to you know engage in those conversations with students? Because I think in terms of prioritization and what type of time we have, I, that's another sort of issue. We don't have very much time of that, 
you know, to devote to that. So I, uh, in addition to thinking about the problem, is thinking about how you can scale it up to help as many people as possible. Okay, I think we're out of time unless there's one last burning question. Elizabeth gave the stand up here. <laughs> and the mic over. So I like the idea of this morning as kind of like what is happening at these other campuses and then the what if, that's great, Christy, to think about this panel. You know, we asked that question and that's how we wound up with the Digital Scholarship Commons. Like what if the library looked into um, what are the gaps in promoting digital scholarship on campus? And you can see that we've had a fabulous out, outcome of that. Um, what if we had graduate students process our un, huge backlog of unprocessed collections and special collections? Well, you can see, you know, really a great outcome for that. And then just a conversation with a faculty member that I know happened a long time ago. So that's a really long-term relationship that we've had with um, the computer gaming program. And then there's internationally recognized research coming out of that. So thinking forward, I think, you know, we have to ask more of those questions about the library on this campus and how we can reach out and really create spaces and services that meet the needs of the students and faculty. And I hope that today is just the beginning of that. Um, so ask us, we'll ask you, and I hope this is just the beginning of the conversation. Thanks for coming. Thanks to the panelists.